Good morning, everybody. Oh, darn it. Dropped part of my mic. Uh, happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to Cameras and Coffee. Today we will get back to our normal, well, our what I had planned for Wednesday. And we're going to look at a bunch of new cameras, camera lenses, that are about to hit the market. And we'll talk about what some of them are, what they'll be good for, and I will come down hard on some of these marketing things. So we're going to start with this article from Digital Camera World. And the title of it is The Monster Nikon Z 58mm F095S Noct could have been even in all caps, bigger. So the general gist of this is that somebody from Nikon, we'll get to that part of the article in a second, made an offhand comment that they were evaluating autofocus for this lens and it would have made it unimaginably larger. So we're gonna tease apart a little bit of what was said in that quote, but right now, the, as it stands, the Noct, which by the way, is a lens I am never even going to hold. So um, I don't even have an interest in trying to get a hold of one to review for this channel because it ain't ever gonna happen. It's pretty impressive. It's a 58 millimeter F095. It's 153 millimeters, which I have to imagine is the length because that's six inches in rough numbers. I can't imagine that's the filter diameter and it weighs in at two kilos, 2,000 grams, which is four pounds, 6.6 .6 ounces for those of us in the US. So I'm struggling to think of a lens that is, that is definitely the largest normal focal length lens ever made. I, I at least cannot think of anything in that size that is larger. Uh, the lenses I know of that are larger, I know that there's some Gonzo one-off Hasselblad or Canon lens. Lenses that went into spy satellites were bigger. Um, a couple of really fast 500, 800s from the 60s and 70s that are specs like the, the Takamar 500 f4.5 and the Takamar 800 f8 should both be bigger than this, but not in a meaningful way. So the quote from um, Mikado Fujiwara, who's a designer in Nikon's optical engineering division, is, of course, we uh, of course we have also studied AF, and driving the focus lens itself can be done. But the action is quite slow, not as fast as manual operation. That's very interesting in and of itself. At the same time, the increase in size is far beyond imagination. It cannot be driven by the existing ultrasonic motor, and a larger actuator must be arranged outside of the lens. Therefore, if you really want to achieve autofocus in the F095 lens, the optical type will not work. You need to reduce the focal lens, uh, the focus lens, and use the internal focusing method. Makes sense. But using this method will result in a longer overall length, which means that peripheral components will also increase and the lens will still be larger and heavier than it is now. Even if such a lens is made, even if the product is very special, it may not be established as a product, so we gave up on autofocus. So let's tease apart a little bit about what that means, and then we'll get to the last part of his quote in here. So, so they did try to get autofocus in this lens, which would very much have helped with this lens wide open. F095 is such an incredibly fast aperture that unless the lens's optics are incredibly well corrected, it's gonna be soft at that aperture. When I use lenses that are I consider fast, 1, 2, 1, 4, 1, 7, um, it's harder to focus them wide open than it is stopped down a little bit. This is especially true with the mirrorless camera with my Sony a7S II because it's autofocus confirm, um, the focus peaking rather, this is the word I'm looking for, 
doesn't pick up on the focus areas when fast lenses like that are mounted onto it because the softness of the large aperture is so great. So at any rate, so they, they tried to make it happen. The action is quite slow, which is likely because of that. Probably because the, the at an aperture that wide, it's going to be a little bit softer, of course, than if you step it down, stop it down to f4, f4, 5, f5, 6 in that range. My not knowing the specs on this lens, my guess is that it's probably the sharpest in the 3.5 to 5.6 range. Also, it's going to be quite slow because there's a lot of glass and metal that have to be moved with this lens when it focuses. It's very heavy. It's 2 kilos, 4.4 pounds. That's a lot of drive for a motor, right? When I built a um, an astro track. I built a type 4 barn door astro tracking system that was capable of moving a medium format camera. It had a, a the the camera it could carry was up to seven pounds and the um, plus the weight of the board. So this is some years ago and I thought I had a big enough motor for it. I got a, a spendy high-end tough heavy-duty motor stripped it the first time I used it. So um, the amount of torque needed to move this kind of weight, especially in a linear direction, is pretty significant. So next, a very interesting thing he said is, it cannot be driven by the existing ultrasonic motor and a larger actuator must be arranged outside of the lens, which means that if they were going to do an autofocus, they would have to have something outside of the lens to physically move it. Now, whether this is like a big motor on the side that has some gearing that moves it or, or what, it's hard to say for sure. But what he's saying here is that they could not mount an ultrasonic motor inside the lens that had enough torque to move the helicoid and the elements likely without destroying the motor very quickly. Therefore, if you really want to achieve autofocus in the F095 lens, this optical type will not work. You need to reduce the focus lens and use the internal focusing method. So many modern lenses coming out, like the Pentax DFA star lenses, the 50 that I have, the 85 that's coming, even some manual focuses like the Rokinon 14 millimeter that I use quite often for my hiking log videos, they have internal focusing. So instead of the lens moving in and out to focus, just some internal components readjust. So at the front of the lens element, stay, the, the front of the lens doesn't rotate and it stays in the same place. So what he's saying is the only viable option to have a 58 millimeter F95 lens that has autofocus is to develop it so that it has internal focusing. Which honestly, if you'd asked me before reading this, I would have just assumed that this lens had internal focusing because that's the way that lens design is going now. It is empirically far superior to having the lens move in and out, especially on consumer grade lenses where the front element also rotates. So it would shock me. It, it, it shocks me to think that a high end lens like this does not already have internal focusing. And so they get, ended up giving up on AF. Basically what it, the, in a nutshell they're saying is that the technology to make a motor that is strong enough to operate this camera's in, in autofocus mode doesn't yet exist. The last paragraph of this article is another quote from him. It says, we want to entrust future generations with the failure to do things this time as future dreams. So he's saying for right now, Nikon's not gonna be able to do it. But in the future, the next generation or two generations of optical engineers might be able to figure out a way to do this. And so that's, I think, the most interesting paragraph because it means that they haven't said, we're throwing in the towel, we're walking away from this completely. They're saying, we recognize the limitations of current technology and we are hopeful that in the future this will happen. Think about it. Back in the 60s and 70s, the top tier lenses coming out today, they are so much better than anything that was coming out then. Same thing is true about the 80s and the 90s. Heck, same thing is true about the early 2000s. Things like internal focusing, high dispersion, um, high refractive index, uh, extra low dispersion, things like that, hyper aspherical lens elements. These are things that are being developed by high-end computer programs today. Could never 
never have been developed by a team of engineers with slide rules and calculation tables. So it stands to reason that while right now there's no AF on a lens like this, in the future someone will have a genius idea that will make it viable. The next one that we're going to talk about is, oh, we'll save that one for last. Um, this comes from digitalphotographyschool.com. I think that's the, yeah, that looks like it. Um, this is Tamron announces first mirrorless all-in-one f2.8 zoom uh, post by James Dempsey. This title is misleading. And I'm, were I the editor of this article, I would not have let that title go through. So the gist of it is, and in the, f the first sentence, they literally correct that title. And it is Tamron announced its brand new 28 through 200. That's a heck of a super zoom, by the way. F28 through F56 for Sony mirrorless. So the title, calling it an F28 lens, it's true, it's an F2.8 at 28 millimeters, but it is not a fixed F2.8 across the entire spectrum. If you shoot this lens at 200 millimeters, it's an F5.6, not an F2.8. So it's an all-around walk, all-in-one walk-around super zoom lens. If you see in my video on super zooms, you'll know I am not a super zoom fan, um, especially ones with a large range like this. They tend to be heavy. They tend to make a lot of compromises on aperture and image quality. That said, because a lot of the lenses coming out now are really spectacular, it's a distinct possibility that this is going to be a, a very good lens by super zoom standards. So um, this is one, if I get the opportunity to test, I'll, I, would, I would do it. I think this would be a fun lens to uh, put through the paces, but it's also going to re retail at $729, which is a whole lot of money for a super zoom, even one that's a, a, um, a standard aperture, a, norm, uh, a medium speed aperture on the wide end, and somewhat slow on the far end. Uh, let's see. Uh, the the last new lens we're going to talk about is a group of lenses. And there's two links for this. There's one from Photo Rumors, and then there's one from MeyerOpticGorlitz.com. The Photo Rumors article is the new Meyer Optic Gorlitz Trioplan 100mm f2.8 2 lens is now available for Canon EF, Pentax K, M42, Nikon F, Sony E, Micro Four Thirds, Fuji X, and Leica L mounts. So to me, the most interesting thing about this lens is that it's coming out in Pentax K, M42, and Nikon F. So for all the people who have been saying those mounts are dead, there will, well, there is at least still this lens coming out. So M42 is a particularly interesting release for me. I, I guess they are giving people who shoot film or who shoot multiple camera formats like I shoot Pentax K and Sony E, the ability to buy one lens and just have some adapters to make it work across their systems. But I think that for film photographers, this is very exciting news. So the, basically the gist of this is that the 100 millimeter F2.8 2 lens is available now. And at this point, I'm gonna switch over to the Meyer Optic Gorlitz site. And the link that I have is titled Trioplan 100 F282, Trioplan 50 F282, and Trioplan 35 Plus. So My Meyer Optic Gorlitz, the brand, is coming out with a bunch of different lenses. And here we go. Show me the photos. That's what I need for reference. Um, but the this page has sample photos, I think, from all three of those lenses, and it doesn't indicate which one is which. But let's go through a few of them here, if I can get this to work. It's interesting going through these photos because I can recognize some of the photographic styles. Oh, the sample photos have changed since yesterday. Weird. 
Okay. They took down some of the model photos that I was going to point out issues with. So there's one photo here that is of a red flower with a purple background and another one that looks like it's a butterfly or probably a moth. Both of these photos show that this lens, assuming this is the 100 millimeter, have some, has some coma, which means used cor correctly in big air quotes, you could probably get some pretty swirly Petzval style out of focus area effects. There's one here of a pelican. This must be stopped down pretty well because it's sharp from front to back. And if that's the case, if those other two were wide open, which they looked like it, given that the out of focus areas were fairly circular ish, they're oval because of the coma, but they're showing circular qualities. If this pelican shot is stopped down, this lens gets really sharp and the um, coma issues will appear to dissipate fairly, uh, fairly early on in the aperture range. So that's good. There's also one here of some pink flowers, which does not exhibit coma, uh, which is curious. So it must be stopped down a little bit. The background's a little bit jittery. Uh, let's see, that's a new one. Uh, then there we've got a, an interesting one here. There's a photo of a woman with black hair and a couple of out of focus dots off on the left side of the image. They do not ex exhibit coma, which makes me wonder if this was shot on APS-C or if it was shot with a different lens because the out of focus circles are round, so it looks like the aperture is wide open, but they're not exhibiting coma. So bizarre. I'm not sure why that is. A uh, really good shot of a match being struck. Really interesting shot here of a light bulb that is broken smoking with some out of focus dots in the background. Same thing, they're not exhibiting coma. Um, and you can tell when something exhibits coma because instead of the circle being the out of focus circle being a circle, if you have like a specular highlight or a fairy light or something like that in the background, they take on an oval shape or like a, a bean shape, especially out towards the edges of the frame. And the further you go towards the edge of the frame, the more bean shaped they become. Then we come back to a picture of a, a pinkish red flower on a green background, fairly jittery out of focus area, but that could be because there's a little bit of depth and the sun coming through the leaves there, reflecting off of them in different ways. And then we're back to the beginning. There were some photos in here yesterday of models that looked very, very heavily processed. And then what I was going to harp on with this is when selling a lens, it behooves the makers not to use photos that are heavily processed because then what they are selling is a photographer's skill with Photoshop, not a photographer's skill with the lens. A, le a good sample photo of a lens will show off its image characteristics and how it performs with minimal processing. Now, if you wanna say, let's correct a little bit of contrast, let's make the colors pop a little bit because it's marketing, that's one thing. But having an image that is so heavily processed that the model's skin looks fake, that the lighting is clearly been manipulated through multiple layers and adjustment curves and things like that in Photoshop, that does not show off the lens's capabilities. It just shows off how much time the photographer can, can tolerate sitting at their desk tweaking sliders. So for you watching this when you want to buy a new lens and you see sample photos don't just get caught up in oh that sample photo has pretty colors or look at how dramatic the lighting in that is look past those things past the obviousness of some of those changes and see what is similar across those sample photos what does the out of focus area look like is it sharp how do the colors look in general? Don't just say this one photo has really nice colors. How do they look across the whole spectrum of sample photos? And in the off chance that lens makers are watching this video or this part of it, it is really unfair to consumers to use 
heavily manipulated and photoshopped images to sell products. Photoshop is not a, a fix for a product that is not as good as it could be. And selling people things based on images that are heavily, heavily photoshopped is just frankly wrong because it's making a promise that can't be met without those additional skills that are separate to what the lens can do. So, uh, so to consumers, just check and check and check and do your research and to manufacturers who do that, shame on you. Now the last article, this is a lens article, but it's not a camera lens article. It's a camera lens, but it's not a camera lens. This is from Forbes. Surprising Samsung Galaxy details confirm a crazy camera. This is the future of cell phone photography for at least the foreseeable future. The next Samsung is coming out with a literal six pack of camera lenses on the top of it and a flash. It looks ridiculous. It really does. But having seen what some of the photos coming out of multi-lens cell phone cameras can do, they have some impressive capabilities. So this ca uh, crazy camera has the, the array camera is supplemented with an, oh wait, that's too far, I think. Okay. So the details on the South Korean's crazy camera comes in a, why call it that? Why not just refer to it as Samsung? Jesus, Forbes. Um, all right. So this is information coming from a recently published patent. So I shouldn't say that the next Samsung will have this system. The patent that's been applied for hints that this is in the works. The patent is titled Apparatus and Method for Operating Multiple Cameras for Digital Photography. There's a link to that patent in the Forbes article. And it describes a system of five wide angle lenses sitting alongside a zoom lens. So basically, the way that I am interpreting this is if you picture a six pack, one of the middle two six pack lenses is a, a zoom, a telephoto lens rather, uh, is a zoom lens. And then the other five in some sort of C or backward C pattern are wide angles. And the patent also illustrates a physical technique to help with the positioning of those lenses, which means that what we're talking about are having five wide angle lenses that can do things like this and move on different axes. So what that means is that if you have ever done an image stitch uh, where you take multiple photos and you stitch them into one image, that's what this is hinting at, where one lens will do this, another like this, another like this, and then the other two may be like this or some sort of arrangement. And then those five images will be composited in camera to make a larger than single sensor image that can, uh, instead of just being like a 28 millimeter, it might function as like a 15 millimeter in 35 millimeter terms to use some speculative numbers. So that's an interesting approach and basically hints at how powerful the cameras are and how powerful the hardware is going to have to be to support that sort of post-processing. Then the telephoto, the zoom lens in here means that it can, if, it's, it's, if it starts off wide and goes to like a, a somewhat zoomed image, if it starts off wide would be able to be the sixth camera that can make those composites. Alternately, if you're taking a picture of a person, those five lenses could focus, um, could create a larger background with some out of focus blur. And then the zoom, the telephoto could zoom in on that person to give you a sharper portrait portion of that image. And then the software could simply merge them all together. Also very promising if that's what they're going to be doing with it. Now, as the, the article says, and I'll, I'll echo, as always with patents, there's no guarantee that a technology, that patents are speculative, basically is the point of this. Just because a company patents something doesn't, ever, doesn't mean it will ever see market, or doesn't mean that it won't continue to evolve and become something different and even more impressive before it comes to market. 
Patents are an insight into what a company is thinking, not into what they are guaranteed to make. So what this is telling us is that Samsung is putting a whole lot of thought into the way that the camera system on their next generation of Galaxy phones will work. And this has been this is just the next step in the evolution of how the um, smartphone market is really becoming more of a photography market and how smartphones are less a tool for phone based communication and more a tool for image and text based, especially image based communication between people. It's the future of that industry of that technology. And quite frankly, with as inexpensive as those are and with as good as they are getting so quickly, they are truly making DSLRs and mirrorless cameras look obsolete. Whether that's the case or not, and I would argue that it's a different type of market because cell phones can't... Auxiliary lenses for cell phones are no good. But um, to paint with a very broad brush. It's a different type of market, a different type of technology, and a different approach to photography. But patents like this do really show that cell phone makers, smartphone makers, are exceedingly focused on how good the photographic component of their future generations of cameras will be. So it's always interesting to see what they're doing and hope that at some point, some of the bigger camera makers look at that and say, you know, there's some really innovative thought in there. What can we adapt to our cameras based on that? Were, it, were I working for a camera maker, I would want to... Now, Ricoh has, with the GR series, made swappable sensors in their cameras, but it would be ver a very interesting setup to have a camera where you can put the lens into it and the lens has a series of sensors in the back of it or you have multiple lenses built into the lens. It would look like a four pack or a six pack of lenses with, small, with sensors behind them that do different things and then having the camera composite them into a single image. That sort of innovative thinking is something that would be really interesting to see in some of especially the mirrorless cameras that could come out in the next few years. That should be in R&D right now. So at any rate, um, the big takeaways from today are there are still very exciting lenses on the market. There are techno technological limitations to what lenses can actually do. And there is some ex exceedingly innovative and creative thought going into camera design in the cell phone market, much, much more so than in the DSLR and mirrorless market, where it's mostly just a specs war and not an innovation war. Have a wonderful Friday and a good weekend, everyone. And we'll see you again, most likely, on Monday.